It's a Christianity that has practically nothing to do with the, the traditional uh, teachings of 2,000 years. It certainly has, uh, has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible. But I now recognize that Jesus actually taught me Christ consciousness. One of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way. We've been looking at the subject of New Age, the New Age Tower of Babel, and this afternoon we began looking at why the New Age is, is so quickly infiltrating Christianity. And uh, we looked at the fact that many professing Christians are not born again, the widespread ignorance among professing Christians, the distinct lack of spiritual vigilance, the lack of warning and education that, that, that exists in so many churches, the slew of modern Bible versions that has contributed to the degrading of the authority of the Word of God. And there's another reason why New Age and demonic doctrines are having such an influence among professing Christians, even among fundamental Baptists, and that is the New Evangelical Movement, which has created a mood of positivism and non-judgmentalism, and, and it's given church members the mindset that it's wrong to judge anything. And if you don't judge anything, then you are an easy prey to the wiles of the devil. And the evangelical ecumenism, which has broken down the walls of spiritual protection and uh, that God has intended that we have. A new mood. New evangelicalism goes back to the 1940s and a new generation of, of Christians came uh, in the 1940s and 1950s arose. Their fathers had been fighting fundamentalists of various varieties. Fighting fundamentalists, they had separated themselves from liberal denominations and had taken a stand for the Word of God. They didn't just believe the Bible, they were willing to fight for it. Jude, verse 3, we are exhorted to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Earnestly contend. Well, they had children, those fighting fundamentalists, had children that grew up in those fundamentalist homes and decided that they did not like that kind of Christianity. And they didn't want to fight anymore. They wanted to be positive. And they wanted to be to get along with everybody. They didn't want to be separating from anybody. Those are difficult things. Those are hard things. Let's just don't do those things and just have a more positive kind of Christianity. And they called themselves New Evangelicals. Harold Ockingay is the one that claimed to have coined that term, a very prominent Christian leader in Billy Graham's generation, a close friend of Billy Graham. And Billy Graham himself was the chief promoter of that philosophy among God's people. I grew up in a Southern Baptist home, and there was nothing but positive feeling toward Billy Graham. And uh, he was just considered the, the absolute giant of the faith. And yet, he taught God's people to ignore separation and just get along with everybody. Don't fight for doctrine, don't stand for doctrine, and, and just be more positive, and just preach the gospel. They repudiated separatism. And today, the evangelical bookstores are filled with heresies because of the influence of this philosophy. Filled with heresies. You go into a big Southern Baptist bookstore, you go into a big chain Christian bookstore, it is, they are filled with heresies. Because of this, let's don't judge thinking. You'll find Norman Vincent Peale there. 
who told Phil Donahue it's not necessary to be born again. That's a heretic. That's a heretic. Yet his books are there, positive thinking. Robert Schuller's books are there, who says hell is just the loss of self-esteem, and Chuck Colson's books are there, very popular. And he says Catholics and Protestants are just a part of the same spiritual body, and we're one, and we ought to learn how to get, to, uh, get along. Chuck Colson, John Maxwell, Philip Yancey, they're there, their books are there. And their books, they treat Roman Catholicism as just another kind of Christianity. Jack Hayford's books are there, very popular. Pentecostal. He says that one day he was driving along in his automobile in Southern California where he lives, and God spoke to him and told him, he was driving by a Catholic church, and told him, That's, those are my people, don't criticize them. Yeah, they pray to Mary as the queen of heaven. Yeah, they believe that a little wafer is Jesus and... Yeah, they're loaded down with heresies. Well, I don't know what voice spoke to him that day, but it was not the God of the Bible. Heretic! C.S. Lewis's books are there. He denied the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. He believed that the followers of pagan religions might go to heaven through their sincerity and their own pagan faith. And you'll find a slew of Roman Catholic authors in these popular Christian bookstores today, men like John Michael Talbot, Peter Kreeft, Brennan Manning, Francis of Assisi, Teresa of Avila, Henry Nguyen, Ignatius of Loyola, John of the Cross, Thomas Merton, who claimed to be both a Buddhist and a Catholic. How can that be? How can these bookstores operated by the Southern Baptist Convention and, and other evangelicals be so full of heresy because of this idea that we're not supposed to judge and, and they're our friends too and they love the Lord too and who are we to judge anything and, and, and let's all just get along. That's not what we find in the Bible. That's not what God commands us in the Scriptures. Y'all could say amen sometime. I know we're in Canada, but hey, don't you believe anything? Say amen. amen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Got carried away there. Forgot where I was. <laughs> That's not what we find here. That's not biblical Christianity. That's popular Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity's never been popular. You want to be popular, then you have to reject the Bible and follow a man-made way because this way is not going to be popular in this wicked world and in the end of the church age, in the midst of apostasy, it's not going to happen. You want to be popular, go somewhere else and turn your back on the Bible because that's what you have to do. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the Bible says that be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Don't be deceived about that. If you associate with the things that the Bible condemns and the things that are contrary to the Bible, it is going to corrupt the kind of Christian living God wants you to have. Don't be deceived about that, God says. That's going to happen. That's why separation is so important. It protects us from the wiles of the devil. It's a walls of protection around us to protect us from these hurtful things and these wolves in sheep's clothing. Biblical separation is not a mean thing. It's not an unloving thing. It is a, it is a, a good thing, a protective thing. It is so important, separation. It's important for your children. If you don't learn how to separate them from evil things, they will be devoured by those evil things. It's, it's important throughout life. 
the farmer certainly has to learn to separate his crop from all the bugs and all the enemies of that crop. Throughout life, the shepherd has to separate the sheep from the wolves. And it's true in the churches. And this philosophy that has permeated Christianity in the last 50 years has allowed every kind of error to come into the churches and just come in. Well, I can't judge it. Toleration of error. The Bible says a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. Twice the Bible says that. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Galatians 5, verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. How careful we must be then to keep that leaven out. Years ago, 1983, just before he died, Francis Schaeffer, very well-known, very uh, influential evangelical leader, he wore the little beard, Francis Schaeffer. He, just before he died, realized what had happened to his evangelicalism. And he wrote a book and warned about it. It was called The Great Evangelical Disaster. And he said, accommodation, accommodation, how the mindset of accommodation grows and expands, accommodating to error. The last 60 years has given birth to a moral disaster. What have we done? He's talking about a moral disaster in the churches. What have we done? Sadly, we must say that the evangelical world has been part of the disaster. With tears, we must say that a large segment of the evangelical world has been seduced by the world spirit of this present age. Tolerant, non-judgmental, let's just be positive, not fight against anything philosophy. And it is sweeping in the fundamental Baptist. It is sweeping in. It is flooding in. Separation is very important. To take a stand for the truth and to teach God's people to take a stand for the truth and keep out the things of the wrong is, is so important. I want to tell you about a woman named Sue Monk Kidd. Sue Monk Kidd, that's an interesting name, isn't it? She was raised in the Southern Baptist Church in Georgia, the heart of the Bible Belt in America. Her grandfather and her father were deacons at Southern Baptist Church. Her grandmother gave devotionals at the Women's Missionary Union. Her mother was a Sunday school teacher. Her husband was a chaplain at a Baptist college, and she attended church Every time the doors were open, every service, she was a Sunday school teacher. She describes herself in those days as the person who would have won a contest for the least likely to become a feminist. Least likely, that was her. She was inducted, in fact, into a group of women called Gracious Ladies. The criteria for which was that one needed to portray certain ideals of womanhood, which included being gracious and giving of oneself unselfishly. She won the contest. She was 30 years old. She had been married about 12 years at the time and had two children. But she felt a spiritual emptiness, a lack of contentment in her Christian life with in a relationship with God. She found prayer boring. A co-worker at church in her Sunday school gave her a book by a Roman Catholic monk named Thomas Merton. I told you about him this afternoon. Thomas Merton. And instead of saying, oh, well, uh, that's, that's probably not the book I need to be reading. The Roman Catholic heresies. She read the book, and she began to practice the contemplative spirituality, the centering prayer and things I mentioned earlier in these messages, things that we've written about in the book on contemplative mysticism. And she began to visit Roman Catholic monasteries and retreats and have times of silence.
She began interpreting her dreams as revelations. My wife has weird dreams, and I'm so glad they're not revelations. <laughs> but Sumon Kid began to think that these dreams, that weird dreams that she had, were divine revelations. An old woman would appear to her in a dream. An old woman teaching her weird things, unscriptural things. And she began to think that God was speaking to her through those weird dreams. She stopped testing everything. She says in her own book, her own autobiography, that this was the turning point, that she just stopped testing things. She said, I would go through the gate with what Zen Buddhists call beginner's mind, the attitude of approaching something with a mind empty and free, ready for anything, open to everything. I would give myself permission to go wherever my quest took me. I'm not going to judge anything by the Bible. I'm just going to be free to follow my dreams. And then she rejected the Bible as the sole authority in her journey. A very frightful part of her book. Her book is called The Dance of the Dis Dissident Daughter. In 1996. And on page 76, she described what happened to her at church one day. Very frightful. She said, I remember a feeling. Uh, the preacher was preaching on, somehow he said that this is the authority, this is the sole authority. And this is what happened to her. I remember a feeling rising up from a place about, down in her stomach. It was the purest inner knowing I had experienced. It was shouting in me, no, no, no. The ultimate authority of my life is not the Bible. It is not confined between the covers of a book. It's not something written by men and frozen in time. It's not a source outside myself. My ultimate authority is the divine voice in my own soul, period. Imagine if your children said that. She is a daughter of a Southern Baptist deacon. No, no, I, I reject these things. She said she came to the point where she was willing to lose her marriage. She began to go into extreme feminism. And her husband, of course, didn't like it that much. And she came to the point where she was willing to lose her marriage for her search for reality. Eventually, she rejected God as father, decided God is a mother. She began to pray to God as a mother. And she came to believe in the divinity of man. In her book, When the Heart Waits, she said, The soul is more than something to win or save. It is the seed and repository of the inner divine, the God image. And now today, she worships herself as a goddess. goddess. She says, I came to know myself as the embodiment of goddess. She has an altar that she built in her study. And on that altar, she has various idols. She has a, a little statue of Jesus. She has a little statue of Mary. She has the other little idols. And she's got a mirror there to worship herself in, her own reflection. She started out as a very faithful member of a Baptist church, very committed, faithful. The last one you would ever think would end up worshiping herself as a goddess. But it happened step by step. She didn't give any biblical testimony of salvation in her book. I'm sure she went through the motions like all Southern Baptists do, like I did when I was about 10 or 11. You know, you, you come forward and you, you, you say a prayer or something, you get baptized. Everybody does it when you're a kid in Baptist church. But this is where she ended up. So these things are very important. This is what's happening today. Why? These spirits are drawing, pulling. Oh, 
that old negative Bible stuff, all that old heaven and hell stuff, or just come out here and be free with us. Be free with us. Spirits are drawing. Powerful winds are blowing in the world today, preparing for the end times, preparing for the rise of the Antichrist. Demons rushing to and fro. The devil walking about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. Looking around the, the herd, you know, how the lions do. The lions are powerful creatures, amazingly powerful. They, they can throw an ox over their shoulder and just trot off with it. Big old oxen. Powerful creatures, but they usually don't just attack an adult, you know, a, a, a big adult member of the herds and animals there in Africa. They just linger around the edges watching, waiting, and then a youngster will stray and they get it. That's who they may devour. He may devour the one that neglects the word of God. Oh, yeah, I said, you know, I hear all these things all the time. I hear that Bible all the time. Yeah. My dad believes it. My mom believes it. But, you know, doesn't mean much to me. That's who the devil will devour. Well, I don't want the devil to devour me, my children, my grandchildren. And so this is why, these are some of the reasons why this is happening. Not having salvation really nailed down in your life. Not being truly born again. We saw that to be born again requires repentance. Repentance is not a complicated thing. Repentance is, it, really, it's coming to Jesus. Jesus calls. He calls. Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. And repentance is turning to heed that call. But when you turn to heed that call and you go to Jesus, you have your back to something. You can't just stand there with Jesus over here, the world over here, and have them both and say, okay, I pray a sinner's prayer, and I'll have my ticket to heaven. That won't get you to heaven. That, that doesn't change your life. Multitudes pray sinner's prayer, and there's just no change at all in their life. No change. That's not biblical salvation. And biblical salvation is not changing yourself. Biblical salvation is God changing me. But I have to turn and receive Christ. And when I turn to receive Christ, I have to have my back to that old life. I'm tired of that. I want the new life. I want God to come into my life. I want him to change my life. I am ready to go a different way. And you cannot be saved without that. And if you say you're saved and you have not had that kind of conversion, it's not a biblical salvation. And multitudes of young people in Baptist churches go through the motions, but they're not born again, and their life is, shows it because they don't love the Bible. If you don't love the Bible, you're either lost or extremely backslidden. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. He didn't say, some of my sheep do that. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Those that do not believe in eternal life criticize us. And they say, you Baptists believe that you can live however you want to and then go to heaven because you have eternal life. But we believe no such thing. Not those that believe the Bible, at least. There's all kinds of Baptists. But Baptists that believe the Bible know that salvation is a, is a life-changing, dramatic new birth. And that if you're saved, there's a change. The Holy Spirit has come. You have new desires and a whole new direction in life. And when you do sin, because you can still sin, but when you do sin, you're chastised because you belong to God. And if you're not without chastisement, you are a bastard. That's a Bible word. 
That's what Bible-believing Baptists believe. Repentance. Oh, I grew up in the church. You know, I didn't know one kid in that church that took the Bible seriously, the church I grew up in. Not one! You can show an interest when you're here. Maybe you're trying to impress somebody. But what about every day? Oh, there's going to be a change. Sometimes I've told the story, probably told it to some of you, about my daughter, youngest daughter. She's a retarded, adopted daughter. And uh, it took her a long time to understand salvation. She was, um, well, nearly 20 years old, I believe, before she really did. But she was quite older because we didn't put pressure on her and we were waiting. And, and uh, but she was very, very sneaky person. You could not, if your back was turned to her, you just wouldn't, didn't know what she was going to do. Sneaky person. She could be the model, you know, child it seemed like to people. But, but if your back was turned, she was just a sneaky little thing. One time, in, we were out in Washington State living, and, she, uh, and in our church there, people started talking about this thing that was going on. And uh, somebody would, was calling up members of the church and not saying anything. You know that weird thing when somebody calls and then they're, they're there, but they won't talk to you? And people said, well, me too. They did that to me too. We had a little church directory there in our home by the telephone. It was my daughter doing that. She, called, she knew she wasn't supposed to do that, but if nobody was looking, she'd pick up the phone, call somebody, but she knew she couldn't talk to them because that would give it all away so she wouldn't say anything. It was my daughter. Sneaky little thing. And I had, in those days, we had an old fixer-up house that, 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 that we had bought when we came off the mission field in 1989. Didn't have any money, but God opened the door for us to have a, an old fixer-up house. And in the back hallway, there was a hole in the floor when I bought that house. And when I sold it, too, the hole was still there. But I covered it up with a little carpet. If it's covered up with a carpet, you can't see it. It's not there. So in those days, my wife had the washing machine and all, and uh, all my socks disappeared. Not just one, you know, you lose the sock. All my socks disappeared. I have to go down and buy new socks. And I talked to my wife about it. You know, what are you doing with my socks? It's got to be her. I'm not doing anything. Of it. Socks. <laughs> and so, um, anyway, eventually, my, my daughter Kathy, she, my wife led her to Christ. And uh, she got baptized and... And so, not long after that, she came to my wife one day. She was crying. And she said, and she told my wife how that for a long time she had been throwing my socks down that hole, <laughs> lifting up that carpet. That's not maybe a huge sin, but brother, that's a sin. Yeah, stealing your daddy's stuff is a sin. Lying and sneaking around is a sin. She changed, though. She changed. She's a prayer warrior today. I accuse very low, but she's a prayer warrior today. These are serious things. Many professing Christians not born again. Widespread ignorance of the Bible. Distinct lack of spiritual vigilance. Lack of warning and education in the churches that will really ground the people so they're not subject to the wiles of the devil. The slew of modern versions and the new evangelical positive thinking. Those things are very attractive to people. And many pastors, because of the Spirit of the hour, bend to the will of the people, 
to let these things come in just to have a church or have a bigger church. But it's not worth it. Nothing is worth disobeying God's word over. Nothing. And the truth has never been in the majority in this world 6,000 years. And it's certainly not going to be tonight. And sometimes I get a little discouraged because, well, you know, there's not many people going to buy my books because I don't write the kind of things they want to buy. If I could write about how the, I saw angels and went to heaven and things like that, or how to build up people's self-esteem, well, not buy those, but <laughs> not these things. But in eternity, the thing that's going to matter is, is what we did with this word. We live in the devil's territory, and today we have a grand opportunity to take a stand for the word of God. And that mightily pleases him. You can be sure of that. Pastor? Pastor?